a sightseeing trip to a remote Mayan temple turns into disaster when professional diver Ken Wilson leaves his friends and gets lost in the jungle. I have no sense of direction what's east, west, north, south. He's lost. He's going further away. And now I'm really concerned. Now he has to learn to survive in this predator-infested hell. But weeks alone in the jungle will destroy his body and his mind. This is not right at all. There is something wrong here. I could already be dead, and I don't know it. Hey guys, how are you doing in the back? I'm hungover, it's your fault. <laughs> how many beers did you drink last night? Professional diver Ken Wilson and his employer and close friend Kathy Gurgens run a small tourist resort on the Mexican island of Cozumel. We sell fun. You're taking people to do something they love every day. And that's when people are happy. And that's the best time to be around those people when they're happy. Ken! Tell him about your first dive. Oh, gather, yeah. Well, uh, I, you know, I used to tend bar in Bonterre. For Ken, this was a chance to quit his job in construction, to do what he loves best, scuba diving. It's probably one of the most peaceful things you could do. You're totally weightless. It's almost a form of meditation. We well, to take you diving, you know, Ken, but you're wearing your wetsuit on back to front. <laughs> <laughs> Kin is like, uh, I would say, uh, something that you find like a rock and you think, oh, you know, this is pretty, I'm gonna keep it. And then you shine it up and you find out he's a gem. Today, they're taking two of their customers to see the ancient Mayan ruins on the island. Right, let's check it out. It's the last day of the holiday, and tomorrow they all return to the US. Hold on. We had six lovely days of diving. On the seventh day, we decided we'll walk around the ruins, work up an appetite, go have breakfast. Hey, you, you want a guide? Uh, no, no tour guides. I'm a, but I'm a good guide. No, no, no tour guides. I'm the best guide ever. The Mayan ruins are all that remains of a lost civilization that lived on the island over a thousand years ago. You just felt like you were in a sauna. It was so hot and so humid, and, and it was just hard to breathe. And then the mosquitoes were just so bad. Well, this certainly isn't the one in the picture. Collapsed and overgrown, the ruins are a far cry from the magnificent Mayan structures Ken had imagined. Let's go a little further and see what we can find. You know what? You guys go ahead. I'll wait for you here. You sure you'll be okay? Can I'll be fine. We begin to work our way out through the ruins, and of course now it's about eleven o'clock, and the heat's really building up. Look, Ken, I'm sorry, I'm going back. It's not long before the other two have also had enough of the oppressive heat. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Me neither. I said, well, I'm going to walk on about another fifteen minutes. I probably should have stayed with them, you know. Located in the center of the island, the ruins are surrounded by hundreds of kilometers of thick, impenetrable jungle. At that time, there wasn't any signs, there wasn't any markers, and it was pretty grown up. Ken is determined to find the ruin pictured on his ticket receipt. But he's having no luck, so he decides to head back. 
I need to get back. Catherine's hot. She needs to leave. We need to go back and get something to drink. But it's not as easy as he thinks. All the paths look the same. So I crossed. You got another intersection, then another intersection. It became a little confusing about which fork of this I was taking, so I began to explore off this branch, and I would come to the next intersection, and this is not familiar. The network of Mayan pathways that centuries ago linked one building to the next is now an overgrown maze, and Ken is lost in the middle of it. I'm sorry, guys. This is really unlike Ken. Half hour goes by. You know, 45 minutes go by. Now my intuition's kicking in. It's going, you know, there's something wrong. Ken's not like this. You know, this is out of his character. The sun's directly overhead. I have no sense of direction what's east, west, north, south. And now I'm really starting to get charged up. I need to rely on a little bit of adrenaline to get me where I need to go. And at that point, that was a state of panic. Then all of a sudden, an hour goes by, an hour and a half, and I said, that's it. There's something wrong here. Kathy! We don't hear him. So I said, let's go back to the entrance. Maybe he's waiting for us back there. Up. Then I heard this real faint call. That's Ken. That's got to be him. Ken! Ken, we're over here! Oh, over here! Kathy! And I said, you guys hear that? And they said, no, what? And I said, just listen. Let's just sit here for a minute. Just, just listen. So we all listened. And then all of a sudden, we heard that call. I said, see, did you hear that? Yeah, I did. Call back. I know that's Ken. He's lost. I heard him call back. Thinking he can make out the direction of Kathy's voice, Ken makes a fatal error. And made the decision to leave the paths and go straight through the jungle to where I heard the noise. Ken thinks he's heading straight for Kathy. But he's been deceived. The thick jungle has distorted her screams. And every step he takes is leading him away from her and deeper into Cozumel's dark heart. Kathy! Kathy can no longer hear Ken's cries. And now I'm really concerned. He's lost. He's going further away. So whenever I didn't hear a response from the last call, it, it really gave a sort of sinking feeling. Kathy! He's hopelessly lost in one of the deadliest environments on Earth. In just three hours, it will be dark, and Ken will have to confront the terrors of the jungle at night. He's been missing for over six hours, and his friend Kathy is increasingly concerned. I asked some of the tour guys there, I said, can you help us? You know, the guy is lost in there, and he didn't come out with us, and I'm really concerned he can't find his way out. Panic drives Ken forward, but he has no idea where he's going. I can still get out of here. Every minute I'm thinking, I can still get out of here. But pushing through the dense forest growth is draining his strength. It, it really began to take a toll on me physically. The brush is so thick, you, you, have, you can never walk in a straight line for more than 10 or 15 feet. So I really have no sense of direction right now. I need to hurry up and get back, get back, push harder, push harder. 
would run into vines, which would tear up my ankles, and I would end up falling down again. It's 4 p.m. In just two hours, the jungle will be plunged into darkness. I might have covered two miles in that, that first burst of energy, but now I'm going really slow. <clears throat> Sun's starting to set in, it's getting darker and darker. Desperate to escape the jungle before nightfall, Ken pushes himself harder. I had caught my leg in a hole, and I thought, well, I've almost broken my leg just now. If I break my leg, I can't walk out of here. And I decide to, to make my camp here for the night. Ken now faces a terrifying night alone in the jungle. A fire is all that stands between him and unseen predators. It was a little bit of an eerie feeling because I'm thinking there could be someone out there watching me. All around him, the jungle is coming alive. I could hear some kind of animal and occasional leaf rust. I had a degree of paranoia, and I, there was no way I was going to be able to sleep in that situation. Scared and alone. Ken's thoughts turned to his friend, Kathy. Of course, in the back of my mind, I knew the whole time that I'm there that, that Catherine is going to be at the forefront of somebody looking for me. He doesn't know it, but he's right. Kathy's raised the alarm back at their hotel. But at night, there's nothing anyone can do. I was crying. I was really upset. I just sat on the edge of the bed, fully dressed, just praying and praying, please, God, help him find his way out. Please help him find his way out. <laughs> Ken makes it through the night. He's had barely any sleep, and his body is still recovering from the exertions of the previous day. You know, the first day, our plan was to go to the ruins and go eat breakfast. So the moment I was lost, I was already hungry. I had not eaten from the night before, and I desperately needed something to drink. But his first priority is to find a way out of the jungle. His flight back to America is due to leave in six hours, and he's determined to be on it. As soon as the sun came up the next morning, I'm... I can still make it to the airplane. I can still make it. I can make it to the flight. Wouldn't that be something if they had all my bags packed and Catherine was at the airport and I ran in to get in line at the last minute? I can still do it. Ken doesn't know which direction to run, but he's sure he must come out of the jungle soon. Now I've got to come out on the road. It's going to be any minute now. The jungle is an assault course and Ken has to climb and drag his way through it. A lot of times when you gotta get it done, you've gotta call on that adrenaline to help you out. You're using your adrenaline as a tool. Yes, I, I can still make it. I can still make it to the airport in time to get on my flight. I'm going faster and faster because, you know, I've got less and less time. <laughs> But racing through the jungle is badly dehydrating Ken. And the lack of fluid is causing crippling muscle cramps. <sighs> At 
And it's too late, anyway. And I knew that that was my flight, and there was no way I was going to make it back to the airport. I've really messed things up. As far as he knows, Kathy is on her way back home, and he is on his own. Ken has no choice but to keep going and try to find a way out. As the day goes on, it's just sweltering. It's like being in a sauna. In this tropical jungle, where temperatures can hit 40 degrees, he's losing as much as 10 liters of fluid a day. Unless he finds water soon, his kidneys, liver, and brain will begin to shut down. I am really dehydrated. I am so thirsty as my mouth is like a cotton ball. You don't care whether the water's dirty or not. Any water will do. It's not a lot, and Ken risks deadly bacteria. But then he hears something to give him hope. I began to hear this drone, this sound. I said, oh, this has got to be the highway. I can hear it. The sound of the road turns out to be the buzz of a huge beehive. Once again, the jungle has deceived him. Ken now faces a second night alone. Using his last match, he decides to build a giant fire, hoping the flames will be spotted from the air. And then this fire is just roaring, and then like, these sparks are going like 50, 80 feet up in the air in this huge fire, and I'm thinking, somebody's looking for me, they're gonna see this, they're gonna see the smoke, they're gonna know where I'm at. Come on, yeah, come on! Come on, this is being up for you! Come on, guys, see this, come on! Come on, come on, come on. And the night began to wear on, and it was like, well, nobody's here yet. Somebody should have been able to see it. Come on, please, come on! But Ken's fire is just a pinprick of light in nearly a 1,000 square kilometers of jungle. Nobody sees it. I wanted someone to, to come in and save me and pull me out of the jungle. For the first time, Ken begins to fear that his decision to wander off on his own may cost him his life. I'm from Missouri, the middle of the United States. I couldn't be further away from where I was grown and was raised, and everything is unfamiliar to me here. This hunger that begins to take over that you can feel your stomach's empty. There's nothing in here. He's past the point of caring where the food comes from or what it might do to him. I found this gourd that was about the size of a cantaloupe that grew in a tree. And I, and I took a taste of it. It tasted like, I can only describe it as the way lighter fluid smells. And I thought, you know, this is really toxic. The biggest aggravation of that was these blood-drawing flies that would just take a big hunk of skin out of your leg. It was like, um, like a, uh, a deer fly. We would call them back home. 
something small the size of a house fly that would bite into your flesh and draw blood and obviously had some kind of bacteria and, and it, would, it would cause some swelling. Unknown to Ken, his friend Kathy is spending thousands of dollars of her own money to launch a rescue mission. I never experienced anything like this. I mean, I love this man, he's my best friend, and I can't even, even imagine what it would be like if he died. Finding anyone hidden under a canopy of leaves spanning hundreds of kilometers would be almost impossible. But Ken is already working on his own solution. And I climb up this tree and start looking around, and I see nothing but jungle. No matter which direction I look, it's just jungle. Ken uses the only tool he has with him, a penknife, to cut down the thick foliage for a better view. Ken can't afford to lose such a vital tool. It could make the difference between life and death. I went all the way down, about 30, 40 feet down the tree with my eyes exactly on it. His route is blocked by a deadly python and his only weapon is out of reach. You know, thinking, well, this is not something that I want to have wrap itself around me. Ken must find the knife. But he knows the python could be within striking distance. and I could not find the knife. I looked around in the leaves, couldn't find it. And something else is lurking in the jungle. I can hear this noise. It was really heavy, I could hear sticks breaking. It kept getting louder and louder. Exhausted, after 80 hours of blindly running through the jungle, Ken remembers the number one rule, should you get lost. You know, they, they always say the best thing to do is stay put. Just stay put, somebody will find you. Almost immediately, his prayers seem to be answered. There has to be some kind of search going on. I decided that I'm gonna climb up this tree and I'll be able to flag down this helicopter that I can hear in the distance. I'm gonna wave them down with this flag. They'll, they'll for sure be able to see me. The helicopter is definitely searching the jungle. Kathy's come through for him. Hail over here! Hail over here! And I see that they're gonna start searching this area, and uh, here I am, I'm gonna be out of here, it's over now. Look out now, here, guys, look! And I'm thinking, 
thinking, oh, this is great. They brought in some kind of American search team. I'll be out of here lickety split. Hook down! Come on! Hook down! I'm here! Come on! Come on, please! I can see this lady inside the helicopter with white tennis shoes with laces. She's wearing gold rimmed glasses, has blonde hair. Hey, come on! I can see every detail. If I would have had a rock in my hand, I could have hit the lady inside the helicopter. I was that close. It was like a for sure moment I was going to be found. But it's not Kathy. The lady is talking to somebody on the other side, and it just keeps going. The rescue team haven't seen him. I'm reliving this in my mind over and over again. I just can't believe this just happened. It was just devastating. Ken has decided to stop trying to walk out of the jungle. Sit tight and wait for another chopper. But staying still makes him easy prey. Well, I would be just covered with mosquitoes in the night. I would cover myself up with 60, 70 leaves like a blanket to try to keep these mosquitoes away. And that would work great for about oh, five, seven minutes till the, the, the mosquitoes would find their way through these leaves. to jump up and, and just be totally aggravated and start swinging leaves around and, and just repeat the process every 10 or 15 minutes, every night. And it was the only way I could keep the insects and the mosquitoes from just eating you alive out there. Over the following days, Ken stays in the clearing, desperately searching for food and water. I found these plants that are growing in the tree limbs, and they're holding their own water. I looked inside. There's a small snail. There's a little frog in there. It was like. OK, this water is really bad. So now I scavenge the whole side of the, the clearing looking for these plants, because there's just not enough water. And I'm really parched. I was sitting there dreaming about snow cones and, and popsicles. If someone were to walk out here and try to sell me a snow cone, how much would I pay for it right now? I think I got up to about Ken's daydreams are a dangerous distraction. He needs to stay focused on survival. Each day, the distant sound of search aircraft torments him. He has no way of catching their attention. They would come in over the jungle and then kind of shut their engines off to an idle and go to stall speed as they would try to peer into the trees to find me.
Ken knows they can't see him through the dense jungle canopy. To make matters worse, he can't find the two liters of water a day his body needs, and he's starving. He hasn't eaten more than a mouthful of fruit in eight days. I mean, my, my body's turned on itself now, and, and it's feeding on my fat and my muscle, and, and I'm really starting to lose weight. The jungle is winning. Ken is losing his grip. I'm in a situation where I'm not talking to another human being, which, if you really stop to think about it, is not normal. How many days does the average person go through and never talk to anybody, never hear a voice on the radio, never talk to anybody on the phone? I mean, it's just, it's not a normal situation. Ken fears he'll lose his mind. And with no sign of any more helicopters, he decides he has to get moving and save himself. I've wasted four days sitting here now. I'm just going to have to get up and walk. He's heading straight through the jungle maze, hoping to hit a path or road. I begin to develop a, a routine. As soon as the sun came up, I would need to begin to walk. And the, the heat of the day would come on. I would have to spend three or four hours sitting in the shade just to conserve the moisture in my body. I wouldn't let negative thoughts influence my situation. If I thought, oh my God, that's disastrous. I'm gonna die here now. If I let that thought come into my mind, you know, maybe I wouldn't survive. But days without enough water and more sleepless nights are pushing his body to the edge of human endurance. I would never sleep more than 15 minutes at a time because I knew there was a threat from wild animals. There's only one way to fend off the animals and get the rest his body needs. A fire. Although he has no matches left, he's thought of a smart alternative. I shorted the positive and the negative battery terminals and attempt to start a fire. There just wasn't quite enough juice in it to, to work. There's one last hope. I decided I'm going to try to build a fire using my shoelaces. Friction is the most ancient way of lighting a fire. With patience, it should generate enough heat to start a small flame. That went on for three hours, four hours. It would just get hot enough to smoke a little bit and stop, but everything there was so wet that the fire just wouldn't start. I was sitting on the floor there just rubbing away in this tree trunk, and I'm thinking, you know, this is not going to work, and my back is in an excruciating pain now. Everything Ken has tried has failed. He's losing the battle. The jungle has started to claim his body. 
Now, it will claim his mind. In the last 13 days, all he's had to keep him alive are a few rancid fruits and dribbles of water sucked from plants. I was thinking all the time that this could go on forever, that I'm not gonna, I'm never gonna get out of here. I know I can't last forever, eventually I would die, but I can't let myself dwell on that. Dehydration is tearing Ken apart. I know I need to eat, but the first call is for water. My body's saying it needs water. He's so desperate, he's forced to drink stagnant, dirty water. And as I'm dipping my camera bag to use as a filter to try to filter out some whatever contaminants could be in this water, I see a small lizard. This little lizard's about four inches long. I could just swallow it whole. I started to swallow it whole, and then it got stuck in my throat because it was still alive. So then I killed him. He ended up being, a, I, I guess you could call that a meal. Desperation is pushing Ken to a place he's never gone before. Fantasy and reality are starting to blur. I began to build these elaborate scenarios about what was going to happen when I walked out of here. I had this credit card and I was going to get a taxi. I was going to buy some clothes and get to a hotel. Hey, take me into town, please. I'll get that, Ken. And it isn't just Ken's mind that is unraveling. His body is falling apart, too. It was mostly my legs that were cut up from going through the brush. Those sores on my ankles weren't healing. I was beginning to be very concerned about if they were going to get infected or not. I found out that I've got these scabs on the upper part of my leg that are beginning to heal because they're dry. So I begin to take some of the, the dry scabs and use them as band-aids to patch some of the wounds around my ankle. It was kind of like a, a band-aid. Ken's situation is desperate, lost, alone, and weak. He's being pushed to the edge of sanity. This helicopter all of a sudden pulls up. There's some kind of loudspeaker in there, and I can hear what they're saying. Mr. Wilson, you're a truly amazing man. But we regret that we must inform your mother. She may not see you again. This is not right at all. There is something wrong here. And I start to hear the national anthem from the United States. Ken is desperately trying to keep his body together. But after two weeks alone in the jungle, he's slowly losing his mind. I'm 
calling room service, I'm filling up the bathtub, and from there on, I don't care what happens, but that's gonna be my fantasy. Just leave it on the table. He's increasingly drifting off into a dream world from which he might never wake up. It was just so many weird things that, and I'm beginning to wonder if it's something within my own mind that is keeping me here. After 15 days of mental torture, it's all Ken can do just to stay alive. My body needed water so bad, it could never think anything but quenching my thirst. It's a very strange feeling, the stress from not being able to drink, not being able to eat, not being able to find your way out. Ken no longer worries about being rescued. Instead, he spends his time catching flies that bite him and feeding them to ants. And from the stress, there was some sort of relief by watching ants eat these flies. It was a revenge. But like the flies, Ken is now part of the jungle's food chain and his own dying body will soon be its next meal. The, the vultures I began to see, two or three, then there was four or five, the next day there might be five or six. I began to use the vultures as a way to try to signal somebody. And I would kind of lay down and twitch a little bit to act like I was something that was dying to try to get the vultures' attention, to get them attracted. To, and that was a way to signal somebody by air because there was, I had no other means to do so. But it, it just didn't work out like that. It was, it was another disappointment. I realized I was gonna die there. Entire days passed by. Instead of trying to find a way out of the jungle, Ken's becoming part of it. Now my clothes are nothing but shreds. I haven't shaved in two or three weeks. You know, I'm just, I'm matted with dirt. I have no shoelaces. Ken is still only alive thanks to occasional mouthfuls of stagnant water. He's physically and mentally broken. I could already be dead, and I don't know it. What if I died three days ago, and I'm my spirit is here wandering around, and this is my destiny of eternity, is to wander around in this jungle? You begin to think, I'll never get out of here. After 18 days missing, even Ken's friend Kathy is starting to doubt he can still be alive. I'm really to the point, like, you know, this is getting hopeless. I mean, it hurt so bad to think that this guy could possibly die. I just laid down and I dozed off a little bit. In a few minutes, I woke up and there was a woman standing there holding a baby. Some people say that whenever people are lost, sometimes they, they'll see the Virgin Mary. It gave me such an adrenaline rush when that happened. It gave me more confidence. I'm going to walk out of here. I'm going to walk out of here. I kept visualizing that in my mind over and over and over again. I wasn't going to sit down and die. 
I, I was going to keep walking until I died. And if I couldn't walk anymore, I was going to crawl until I, I got out of the jungle. This is like one of the first things I've seen of civilization since I've been lost. Say I was hallucinating, maybe I could have been, but it seemed all way too realistic. Once I, I had came out there, I knew exactly where I was because I'd been there before. right at the beach in Cosmel, the north end of the island. I was ecstatic. I'm not lost anymore. I made it out alive. After 20 days fighting crippling hunger, dehydration, sleep deprivation, and jungle predators, Ken is finally safe. He had his hair packed, like spiked with mud big cuts and scratches and just look like he's just been chewed up. I felt really bad because she started bawling and that made me start bawling. The tears were just rolling. We just couldn't let go for 10 minutes. I mean, we were just so thankful he was alive. It really brought us really close. Ken's recovery took six long months. To help cope with the ordeal, he returned to his greatest love, scuba diving. The experience changed the way that I think. The fact is, within 10 seconds, any of us could be gone. So I decided I should be more kind to other people. I should be more generous with what I have. I'm just happy.